catch and kill some of the bacteria that's harmful. Um, someday bacteria may be killed by another process. Uh, there's resistant strains, bacteria called uh, MRSA, you might have heard of that. Uh, MRSA is actually a resistant strain, uh, it's, an, it's resistant to antibiotics. Well, we may change our approach to that. Uh, bacteria actually can communicate with each other through something called quorum sensing, and it might be possible to disrupt their communication. Basically take down the bacterial internet and keep the bacteria from talking to each other and getting sick. So there's a lot going on and a lot changing. All right, since you guys are in biology or environmental science, some of you have physiology, what I wanted to talk about is, again, like I said, something that's not specifically in my area of expertise, but it is uh, something that, that affects human spaceflight. And that is, what are the effects of spaceflight on the human body? And Matt, are we close here? Or? Yeah, you're all set. Okay. I'm not going to get the keys on, right? That's fine. Stay awake. <laughs> okay, so, so um, again, just sort of get into uh, uh, what I was uh, going to talk about here is just the human spaceflight, human, the effects on humans of spaceflight, specifically uh, zero gravity or weightlessness. Um, is there gravity in space? No. Yes, there's gravity everywhere. Okay, gravity is, is a weak force, but it permeates everything. So if you are jumping off of a diving board, are you in a gravitational field? <coughs> yes. Absolutely. How do you know? You fall down. Right. The sudden stop at the end tells you something about that. But that's physics and we won't deal with that. Okay? When you are jumping off the diving board, on the way down, what do you feel? Well, the gravitational pull is acting on you, but just from a physiological sense, if you closed your eyes, what do you think you would feel? Air. Weightlessness, thank you. Yes, you definitely feel the air, but, but weightlessness. Okay? Now, you can simulate the effect by either jumping off the diving board with your eyes closed. Good luck with that. You know, kind of just like, gee, I wonder how I'm going to land. But uh, <laughs> if you're ever in a swimming pool and uh, you just uh, take a deep breath and just relax your body completely with your head basically floating down in the water, which, so your kind of shoulders are at the water surface, and if you relax completely, you can get a very good sensation of weightlessness. You're being supported, your body's buoyant, so you're being supported by the water around you. So you can get that kind of feeling. Now, if you go up into outer space, there is gravity, because if there weren't, then things wouldn't orbit other things, and things wouldn't stick on the surfaces. So for example, Earth is held around the sun by the sun's gravity. So the gravitational pull pulls on Earth and keeps it in orbit around the sun. If it didn't, and the sun's gravity were to disappear, Earth would fly off at a tangent and just keep going. Now, that means that objects that are orbiting around Earth are being pulled by Earth's gravity. If Earth's gravity disappeared, then the International <coughs> Space Station would just fly off in a tangent the way it would go. So the gravity is pulling all the time. When the astronauts are inside the International Space Station, or the space shuttle, or any other space vehicle, they are actually experiencing weightless because, just like jumping off a diving board, they are falling. But they're not falling straight down to Earth, otherwise it would be a very short space voyage. They're falling around Earth. So let me, let me explain that before I get to, to the, the slides here. Imagine I've got a baseball. And imagine that there's no air resistance and no wall over there either. If I take the baseball and I throw it straight out, okay, not up or down or anything, if I throw it straight out, what's it, what's it, what is its path going to be? Okay, it's going to fall down. It's going to go down. If I had something to throw, I'd, I'd do it, but everything was electronic here. Okay, if I, it, what's the path it's going to take? What, what, you know, what shape the path is? It's an arc. You know what kind of arc? Yeah, it's a parabola. Yeah, it's going to, 
it's going to fall ballistically here as a parabola. Okay? If I throw it harder, again, straight out, what's it going to do? Okay, so it's the same thing, but it's going to go farther, but it's still going to hit the surface. If I throw it straight out, the minute I, it leaves my hand, it, the path is going to be kind of, kind of like out straight, but a minute it leaves my hand, it's going to start to fall a little bit. And the long, farther it goes, the more it's going to fall. Okay, what happens with, if I take that baseball, and again, no air resistance and no wall or anything else. If I throw that baseball at a particular speed, and that speed turns out to be 17,500 miles an hour. Okay, if I throw that at 17,500 miles straight out, the ball is going to fall, start to fall the minute it leaves my hand, but it's going to be going so fast that the amount that it falls doesn't appear to be very much, at least at first. But what happens is at that speed, I will have thrown it so hard that as the ball falls, the surface of Earth, which is a sphere, curves out of the way. And the ball, as it falls, is falling towards a surface that's curving out of the way underneath it. So right now, it looks like I'm on a flat floor, and if I throw the ball, the ball's going to hit the floor. Well, I'm not on a flat floor. I'm on a, on a, a little arc on an object that's 25,000 miles in diameter. So I don't really, excuse me, in circumference. So I'm not really seeing it. But the ball is falling, the floor is falling, so what happens is they're basically falling together. And at 17,500 miles an hour, if I throw the ball, it'll fall all the way around Earth, and 90 minutes later it'll come back around and I can catch it, assuming I can catch something that's going 17,500 miles an hour, I'd probably just get out of the way and it'll go around again. That's exactly what the International Space Station has been doing. For the last decade, a, a, a very massive, many, many tons of metal built by the United States, Russia, Japan, and the European Space Agency has been falling around Earth and will continue to do so. Now, there's a little bit of atmosphere up there, so a little bit of drag, so we have to boost it up every, every once in a while, but basically, it's falling. So the astronauts are inside of this. They're not looking outside. They don't see, they can, but they're not seeing what's going on. They're falling inside something that's falling, too. So the classic model is an elevator, so if the elevator cable breaks, and you're in the elevator, what's going to happen? No, elevators have a fail-safe in it. It'll grab the sides and it won't fall. So all your fantasies about dying in a collapsing elevator doesn't happen. Okay, the elevator cable, you can get the cable. It does not fall. Sorry, Bruce Willis, it just doesn't work that way. Okay. But if you were in an elevator that didn't have the safety features, the elevator would be falling and you would be falling at the same rate, which means that inside you'd, you'd be flat floating around. I think this is great, you know, you can bounce off the walls and everything else. Again, until you got to the ground floor, it's, again, it's not the fall that kills you, it's a sudden stop at the end. So, same thing with the International Space Station. The astronauts are in the station, and they're floating around inside that particular camp. <coughs> All right, now, for the most part, live, work, function, just great. There's never been any really serious problems uh, with that, um, but there are some interesting effects, and again, this keystone is gonna be a little bit interesting, considering what I'm trying to show you, but uh, this is uh, an astronaut, his name is Mike Barrett. Okay, and this is his, uh, his official NASA uh, photograph. He's a medical doctor, and uh, he um, flew on the International Space Station for a six-month mission. He's actually going to fly another shuttle mission. There's only going to be five or six more shuttle missions before the shuttle's retired. And uh, you know, it's going to be a while before it's replaced with something else, so we're going to have to buy tickets from the Russians to get to our space station. At more than $35 million, too, by the way. Okay, uh, just for a sense of size and scale, there's Mike. And that handsome guy on the left. <laughs> okay, now here's Mike on the International Space Station. You notice anything different about him? Okay, yeah, he's, he's got to hold something. He's got his feet hooked into a little strap there. There's drops all over the place. But, but about him himself. Red. Yeah, face kind of red. That mostly is thanks to the projector and computer. Anything else about his face? <laughs> okay, let me, let me go I'll go a little bit further here. Um, kind of hard to see. But this thing right here, is a, uh, uh, there's three of them, they're different colors. Um, about the size of a basketball, it's actually a free-flying robot. Uh, and if you have several of these, they can fly together. And the idea is that you can send these things out to do like reconnaissance. So instead of doing a spacewalk, if you want to inspect the space station, you take one of those, push it out an airlock, and then it flies along the space station, tells you what's going on. Um, also, the goal is to have them kind of like uh, your, your own little uh, um, iPhone or PDA that follows you around. So as the astronauts go around in the space station, this thing follows them around, and it can like look over their shoulder and take camera pictures and notes and so on, and you can talk to it and record stuff, and you can get several of these things working together. So pretty cool. You can only do this in a weightless environment. Remember, it's falling, everything else is falling.